First Century Diaries, The Silas Diary, Chapter 5. On each of the next two nights, the holy ones from Corinthia, Lepithus, Ledra, Tomasus, and Citium gathered in the Trichnium, the living area of the house, to hear Barnabas and Saul. Time and again the two men heard the plaintive, the plaintive request that they remain on the island to help the churches. On the morning of the third day, a breathless messenger arrived from Paphos. I am from the proconsul's palace, a relative of yours, a Hebrew named Kala, sent me. He serves our most honorable proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul desires your immediate presence, for his term as proconsul of this island ends within a month. He wishes to hear from Saul of Tarsus before returning to Rome. Can Saul come immediately? Barnabas looked at Saul. It takes precedence over other matters, I should think. But it will take us three days to get there. Is Sunday acceptable? He asked the messenger. I will take your message to Kala. I believe Sunday is acceptable. We should leave immediately, observed Barnabas. We'll go through Kuhia and arrive at Old Paphos by the Sabbath. New Paphos is nearby. Saul was in a reverie all his own, the proconsul of all Cyprus. Very interesting. Perhaps this is the very thing that will aid us in our decision concerning Cyprus, to stay or to leave. Mark was silent, his counsel his own. His only hope was that the sisters of Sidium would not be too generous in preparing food for their journey. Within an hour, the three men had said their goodbyes, and stepped out into a misty night, following the road leading to the western tip of the island. Friday afternoon, just before the Sabbath began at dusk, the three men arrived at the ancient city called Old Paphos. There is only one family of believers in Old Paphos, they had been told at Citium. It is with this family that they found lodging. Word of your possible arrival has reached the local synagogue, their host told them. He must stay away from the old Papo synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue, a man named Shadian, has opposed the way from the beginning. It is only in old Papos that most of the Jewish community has not received its Messiah. It is Shandia's, Shandian's rage against believers that stood in his way. Shadian has heard of Barnabas and of Saul's converting to the Messiah. He is not pleased. We counsel you not to go there. Saul was unmoved. Perhaps we will catch him on one of his good days, he suggested. Early on the Sabbath morning, Saul ventured up to the door of the synagogue, sure he would be given an audience. After all, he was a Pharisee. To Saul's surprise, Shadian met him at the door. Saul, is it true that you have accepted the teaching that Jesus is the Messiah? Yes, and not only that. But I have seen him face to face on the road from Jerusalem to seize him, ordered Shadian. Three men waiting just inside the synagogue door suddenly appeared, grabbed Saul, and hauled him into the synagogue. Just as quickly, they pushed him to a whipping pillar about three feet high and bound him to it. We will beat this lie out of you, Saul of Tarsus, growled Shadian. Let all see what should be done to those who follow a carpenter. Shadian took his place right in front of Saul who was now held firmly across the whipping column. As you are beaten by your Hebrew brothers, remember that you ordered hundreds in Jerusalem to be beaten in the synagogue of the holy city for the same crime for which you yourself are now guilty. Remember this with every lash, and then turn from your evil. Return to Moses. Shadian nodded to one of the men standing behind Saul. With that, a whip with four straps appeared. The whip whistled in the air and found its mark, ripping at Saul's flesh. One by one, thirty-nine such lashes tore into Saul's already scarred back. The beating ended and Saul was thrown bodily out of the synagogue. He staggered back to the home where he was staying. 
five different times the Jews gave me 39 lashes. It was because of that horrid day that the Hebrew believers on Cyprus gave up all doubts as to whether Saul was a follower of Christ. John Mark, who later spent many years on Cyprus, told me that there are many believers in Old Paphos today. You should go there. Those believers will take you to the very place where Saul was beaten for his faith. The pillar he was tied to is still there for all to see. Bathe my back and bind it well. Tomorrow morning there must be no blood seeping through my shirt. The proconsul of Cyprus must not see that I have been whipped. But Saul, protested Barnabas. I know, responded Saul. When you remove the strips of cotton, the pain will be terrible, and the healing will have to begin all over again. It matters not. There must not be so much as a drop of blood that shows through. Tomorrow, no evidence of this beating. Kala, the man who served the proconsul, arrived early Sunday morning. My master, Sergius Paulus, will see you at noon, he said. The audience, Kala, how did it come about? An unknown Jew before a Roman proconsul? He is proconsul of the island, yes, and I am a slave, but we are friends. But why this audience? Paul is a botanist, a scientist of no small renown. He has a son living in Rome. His, daughters live, his daughter lives here on Cyprus in the palace. She is very interested in our Lord Jesus. As to Paulus, I am not sure. He is a thinker. But on the other hand, signs seem to play a significant part in his life. He is intrigued with the story of your miraculous conversion. You have only one thing to fear, Saul. That is, besides fainting from your wounds. Fear? Yes, a rascal named Simon, who serves as Paulus' advisor. Simon? Yes, I know of him. He's an imposter. Part liar, part Jew, part follower of Christ, and part magician. Or so he claims. That man has a heathen's heart and a robber's mind. Yes, that is Simon, agreed Kala. You describe him well. Sometimes he goes by the name Elimus, which means sorcerer. And sometimes he even calls himself Bar-Jesus, or son of Jesus. He will probably introduce himself as such. Purple rage swept across Saul's face. More to the truth. He's the son of, come, we must hurry. Get into the palace as, is a, getting into the palace is a task within itself. Remember, Simon is the consort of Paulus. He does not plan to lose his employment as a result of your being here to speak to the proconsul. He will oppose you to your face if Saul was not listening. Does Paulus know Claudius personally? Uh, you mean Claudius the emperor? Yes. Well, I think he does. Why? Does he know him well enough to get me an audience with Claudius? Are you mad? No. I am a Roman citizen. Saul of Tarsus, there is no room for a man to be a citizen of Rome and still be mad. Saul smiled. One day I shall see Rome, and perhaps the emperor, that is, if I find time to do so. Now let us go so that I might tell a Gentile, who also happens to be a Roman proconsul, the wonderful news about Jesus Christ. The rumors about you are not big enough, Saul. Saul turned and faced Kala. Never forget, I have seen Jesus Christ, not as the carp carpenter of Nazareth. I saw the resurrected, ascended, enthroned Lord. What space can a mere proconsul from Rome or this Simon take in the presence of such glory? Now tell me, Kala, how did Sergius Paulus come to receive the honor of being made ruler of Cyprus? Well, responded Kala, taking a deep breath, when the Romans took Cyprus from the Greeks, there was discontent throughout the island. The emperor sent an army here, an army overseen by a man appointed as governor, a governor who reported directly to the emperor. When the people of Cyprus finally settled down and accepted their conquerors, the emperor turned Cyprus over to the Roman Senate. No longer would there be a governor here appointed by the emperor. The Senate was in charge of Cyprus, and the Senate chose someone called a proconsul to govern the island. The army was then removed from the island. This year, the proconsul happens to be Sergius Paulus. I only hope next year's senatorial appointee is a kind, is kind a man as Sergius. May Cyprus like him, whoever he is. Cyprus wants no more of the emperor and his army. The people are happy to be ruled by the Senate of Rome. 
Even a small garrison of guards and charioteers is more than enough for us. Our people in Israel have never had a Senate-appointed proconsul, responded Barnabas. Israel has always had governors and a large Roman army. We will probably never have a proconsul. Even now, hidden under the surface of the Roman-imposed peace, there is great discontent throughout Israel. Even now, the emperor is sending in more soldiers. There is so no, no such danger here, laughed Kala. We learned our lesson. At that moment, the three men entered New Paphos. See the port? It is new. It was built to serve old Paphos, but a new city grew up around the port. The people of old Paphos still resent the port and the new city. Look up there on that high bluff at the very tip of the, of the island. That's the proconsul's palace. Then let us be on time. We must not keep a proconsul waiting. We dare not start a Roman war, laughed Saul. Thank you.